Hello and welcome to Talking Books. I'm Jill de Villiers. When you're caught up in the rat race and it seems your day-to-day -day life is determined by the demands of others, it is natural to ask yourself the questions, can I be my own boss and be in charge of my own destiny? These are questions that arise in the autobiography we're going to talk about today. My guest is advertising industry veteran and businessman Peter Wundler, the author of the book Doing Time, who is currently the non-executive chairman of AMB Capital. Welcome, Peter. Thanks very much for joining me. Thank you very much, Jill. Nice to be here. Your autobiography, it, it's a linear account of, of your life, and it is, it's a fascinating read. Mm -hmm. And I think let's uh, start in the early days mm -hmm. and the influence that your family had on your development, your growing up years. Can we, you tell me just uh, about a little bit about your father, who was a very formative influence in your life? He was indeed. Yeah, my father was a formidable man, and uh, I have actually patterned my life after him. And uh, he was a very principled man, and uh, he, uh, he wasn't afraid to you know, tell you what he thinks. And, uh, and uh, he was very loving and and I think it had much to do with his rural background. And uh, he taught us to be responsible, to, to care, uh, to serve, and, uh, and all of those amazing values that uh, we do not seem to have in most families today. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he was a great influence on my life and also a depth addresser too, yeah. <laughs> he does very well, yeah. But he also taught you in terms of politics and relationships with, with people and living in the city um, in the days before Soweto was even established. Correct, yes, yeah. He, uh, he, he was very great at uh, building relationships and, uh, and that's something else I learned from him because for me, if you're wanting to succeed, you have to look after the relationships, you know, whether with your family, your, your neighborhood, your taxmen, uh, uh, your, your customers, your, uh, your staff, your suppliers. Uh, I mean, life is really about relationships, and that I learned from my dad, yeah. You also knew one of his friends was Madiba. Oh, yeah. I actually um, met with Madiba, well, kind of <laughs> funny thing to say, I met with Madiba. Yeah, I first saw Madiba when I was about five years old. And as I say in my book, I, uh, I saw this tall guy and he always was dressed in a flannel, which is gray, gray trousers and, uh, and a navy blazer. And, uh, and of course, he's a well-known uh, haircut. So yeah, he, uh, Madiba used to come to our home quite frequently in Western Native Township. So that's where I think I began to be kind of politicized too, yes. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to you lating, meeting with Madiba later uh -huh. again when he, when he came out okay. of prison. But uh, let's go to your schooling. And you went back to the Eastern Cape for your yeah, schooling. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 I did uh, my primary schooling mostly in, uh, in Western Native Township. Then we moved to Soweto. And uh, I went to Morris Isaacson. Uh, and subsequent to that, then my parents sent, no, Morris Edison came after I went to Hilltown, which is where I did my, my, my junior certificate at the time. And, uh, and, w uh, and I went to Hilltown, which is where my dad was born, uh, in Fort Beaufort. And I went back again to Fort Hare, you know, after I matriculated at Morris Isaacson. So, yeah, there were two students out yeah. in uh, the Eastern Cape. And you were a bit of a troublemaker in your youth. Yeah, that's what uh, I was called at uh, both high school and the university. And, uh, and, and on both occasions, I was uh, expelled. And, yeah. And how did you deal with that? Oh, well, <coughs> the way I dealt with it, my dad saw me and those others who were expelled as future leaders. So I was very <laughs> proud of <laughs> getting expelled, and I thought, no, no, maybe I do have a future in politics, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then, like my dad used to say, uh, uh, you know, there are better ways of earning a living than going into politics. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then you also had the occasion when you came back to Johannesburg and you started working here to meet with Winnie Mandela who invited you to join the ANC. ANC, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, this is after, uh, you know, the 1968 uh, uh, um, student uprising at Forte. And I felt at the time that, you know, the ANC wanted to kind of uh, infiltrate or, or begin to, to, to leverage 
you know, this uh, strike at uh, Forte, and I wasn't a supporter at the time of, uh, of, the, of the ANC. I was actually a, a Pan-Africanist. Oh. And Winnie tried to recruit me into the ANC, and uh, I um, politely declined. declined. Yes. <laughs> yeah. oh. So your first encounter with consumerism was when you started working um, at the Research Council, the Marketing Market Research, Research Africa, uh, yeah, correct, yes. Uh, tell me a little bit about that and why th that sparked your interest in consumers. Yeah, well, I, uh, I, I haven't been expelled from Forte, uh, and we were at least allowed to correspond with the University of South Africa. And, uh, and so I, uh, I got this job at, Mo at, at Market Research Africa, and I looked after the archives, which is basically old research material, and I used to use the library, basically. And I used to read the research reports and, uh, and, 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 and the recommendations, and, and subsequent to that, I, I got into advertising as a, as a research executive. So that sparked my interest in, uh, in, in, in research and marketing, yes. Uh -huh. Tell me about your early days in advertising, and that was during the time that things were quite difficult during apartheid and there was segregation in the office space. Yes, there was, and even when I did enter, I, uh, I, 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 I got in through Samo Sikidi and people like Horis Mpanza and Madala Mpatlele, and, uh, and that was because the client at the time was, uh, you know, for visa, it was uh, South African breweries, and they needed some black input uh, into the so-called black market, and uh, and so I was brought in basically based on my color, if you could say, and and just to give input in as far as black consumers are concerned, mm -hmm. and uh, and but then I um, said from the very beginning that I don't want to be an expert on black consumers. I want to be an expert all round, sure. you know, to speak authoritatively on the colored market, the Indian market, the white market, mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. So you, you finally achieved that by starting your own company. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, ten years after doing time <laughs> at uh, Ogilvy & Mather, I broke away with uh, three other partners and we established uh, Head Boys in 1991. And what a journey it was, hey. Oh. And I ran Head Boys for some ten years as a CEO and then another ten years as a, a non-executive chairman. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, uh, for young people who look at advertising today, um, and they see the way that we advertise to everybody, mm. uh, don't realize how exclusionary advertising was in those in the early days. Uh, how there was advertising for Afrikaans speakers, for English speakers, it for was Zulu indeed speakers. Segregated, uh, yes, uh, it was indeed segregated. Uh, tell me how the battle you had, the fight that you had to start integrating. Oh, it was a big battle, and it didn't help that uh, e even the media was segregated, and uh, and the SABC didn't allow for for, for a multiplicity of languages in a sem in a single commercial, and so uh, we had uh, we, we, we our approach was basically to say a consumer is a consumer is a consumer, and then we also believe that. The, the, the so-called black market, which we subsequently renamed the main market, was not homogenous. It was not a homogenous market at all. And, uh, and so we began to, we had to inform our clients, uh, actually educate them basically, uh, about s you know, simple issues like, well, you know what black people eat. And, 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 and we always said that if we're going to differentiate uh, consumers. It has to be on the basis of not color, but uh, on issues such as, for example, income. Mm. And, uh, and uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I want to say so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's so much. Um, yeah. And there's still so much in your book as well, because we're not even halfway through your book Indeed, at this yeah. point. Yeah. Um, but then, as well, you say, that nobody has become a millionaire or has become rich through advertising, so mm -hmm. you have to start investing. Uh, just tell me briefly about your uh, journey into investing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people kind of think they, they can get into advertising to become millionaires. No, it, it, it doesn't work like that. And so, yeah, I, uh, 
I, 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 I think through my relationship building, I was invited uh, down the line to be sitting on various boards, uh, uh, some of which were my client's boards, you know. And, and I became to be seen more as a businessman than as an ad man. And so I, um, I was invited then to become chairman of uh, <laughs> one company called Pamuzi, <laughs> to my regret, <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, I partnered with uh, people who didn't share my values. But anyway, that began my, uh, my, my journey as an entrepreneur, uh, I think uh, beyond just uh, advertising. And I started, you know, investing in uh, uh, various sectors, mm -hmm. whether it's ITC or... Uh, you know, financial services and those kinds of things, and I became more of a businessman, yes. Now, part of this journey, you also became very instrumental in designing BEE. Oh, yeah, yes. I, uh, I, I yeah, I, uh, you know, having come out of a, uh, a, 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 a business environment where there was no BEE, mm -hmm. and uh, because all, all, all that we did as head boys was pre-BEE, I was then uh, invited to sit on the BE Commission to draft the commission, which we did, uh, and Cyril Ramaphosa was chairman. And then we drafted the BE Commission report. And, uh, and, and, and since then, I've been a very strong proponent of uh, black economic empowerment. And I, I, I remain one, yes. Oh, and do you think we're on the right track with that at the moment? No, I don't believe mm -hmm. so. I think uh, uh, what we see are aberrations of uh, black economic empowerment, uh, the poor implementation, and uh, there's lots of fronting. There's still lack of capital is still a big issue for black entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, credit committees in banks and uh, funding institutions are basically white people, which is a shame, I think. And because they are the people who determine who's going to be empowered or not, where, where, where the capital is going to go to. And uh, no, black economic government has gone all right, but I don't believe uh, 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 there's anything better, a better solution you know, to, to that in terms of uh, finishing the unfinished business, because we have a lot of unfinished mm -hmm. business in our country. And, uh, and a lot of redress is still required mm -hmm. if we are to be an equitable society. Peter, thank you so much for coming in thank you, Jill. and chatting <laughs> to us. Um, I must tell you that we have only touched on um, all of the very interesting things that, that are in this book. Um, I would suggest that you get it and read it. it is, it's a fascinating read. Um, so just to recap, my guest today is Peter Wundler and the book is Doing Time. And that was it for this edition of Talking Books. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Thank you.